I didn't meet in the last session or haven't met yet, I'm Stacy Kalish. I'm one of the board members of NTSAD, and I'm a clinical geneticist. And in my uh, role with NTSAD, I serve as the chair of the research committee. And so we work with the scientific advisory committee and the corporate advisory council um, and the board to help make some decisions about how we fund research. And we also do all of our research communications to bring all of the information about the research we're funding and research other people are doing to you guys in a way that you understand it. So for those of you who have been here before, you notice that this is a little bit different. So we've changed up the format. In the past, the small tables that we did were really nice because you could hear, you could be closer to the researchers and ask questions directly, which made people comfortable. But we got so big that it was hard to hear anything. And so we thought that what we would do this year is have each of five speakers come up here they're going to talk to you for about 15 minutes. This way, everyone will be able to hear them, and their slides will be up on the screen, so you'll be able to see any videos or pictures that they bring. And then when they're done, we will have small tables, and all of the speakers will sit at small tables small tables. There'll be an additional small table as well, so that you can then approach all of the speakers and ask them questions in a, in a smaller format or hear more about what they have to say. So uh, in a, I'm going to introduce Dr. Fran Platt, who's the chair of our scientific advisory committee. She'll introduce all of the speakers to you. I will tell you that the speakers each have 15 minutes to give their talks. I see faces already. We're going to hold them to their 15 minutes because we want you to be able to hear from all of them. And then we want you to be able to have time to sit at tables with them and hear more in that smaller format without us running over into the later evening session. So, so the last scientific meeting that I was at that most of these guys were at is goes like Academy Award style, where at the end of your 15 minutes, the lights go off, your slides disappear, the microphone cuts. We won't be that strict, but I will be up here. I will be giving five minutes and three minutes and Around 15 minutes, I may come up and take them off by hand. Some of you have seen me do this before, so don't doubt. I, I will. <laughs> we will move on. So um, if there's time left over at the end of the 15 minutes, we may take a question or two um, then. And if not, then we'll wait till you go to the small tables. Does anyone have questions about format? Speakers all should talk to you in ways that you understand. If you have questions afterwards, they're all extremely approachable. They're all very happy to talk to you one-on-one, -on -one, to answer any questions. Also, any of us who are around, you're welcome to ask us questions also. So this is Dr. Platt. She's the chair of our Scientific Advisory Committee, and she's going to introduce our speakers. Thank you very much. Um, so you have to put up with a British accent, I'm afraid. So um, I'm a basic scientist. And um, it's my pleasure and honour to chair the Scientific Advisory Board for um, NTSAD. And one of the amazing things that you'll be hearing about is that there's a very dedicated group of scientists and clinicians who have been funded by this organisation who are going to update you on their research progress. And we're going to have talks on each of the diseases that are covered by the remit of, uh, of the organisation. So without further ado, uh, Carol Kramer is our first speaker. And she's going to be talking about enzyme replacement therapy for GM1 ganglicidosis. Um, and she was uh, a recipient of a grant, I think, in 2014. Great. Thanks so much. Um, uh, we're waiting for my slides, because he thought somebody else was going to be the first speaker. Um, so my name's Carol Kramer, and I am the chief scientific officer of a small biotech company that has been very focused um, specifically on trying to, fi to, to find innovative ways to deal with some of the big barriers for getting enzyme replacements into the brain. Um, so uh, the Tay-Sachs Tay Foundation funded us for looking at whether or not we could use our lectin-assisted carrier, and I'll tell you what that is, in order to move um, enzyme into the brains of GM mice, in our case. Um, and just to point out, I'm here with David Radin, who's the, the um, managing director of the company, and we've also done this work in collaboration with Sandra Diazzo, and probably many of you have met Sandra because she has been funded by your, your organization as well. Um, so what is enzyme replacement therapy? You guys, I'm sure, know that people with GM1 ganglioscidosis are missing an enzyme that is called beta-galactosidase. And the idea of enzyme replacement therapy is that you actually replace that missing 
um, enzyme, that protein, by giving it to, to the patient by IV, typically once a week or once every two weeks, and that mobilizes through the body and corrects the disease. Um, the problem is, do I need, um, is that all of the current ERT strategies, in fact, are not very successful at getting it to the brain. In fact, they don't get to the brain at all. So we're trying to address that. So our technology is based on something called a lectin. A lectin is a protein that binds sugar. And I'll tell you why we think that's cool. Um, and the lectin that we use is called RTB. It's like, um, was just explained as the FDA GGGGT. RTB is the only one you have to remember for us. Um, and the idea is that we actually make a genetic fusion where the RTB, which is a protein and is a carrier, and we bind the human beta galactosidase uh, enzyme to it so that it's made as a single gene and then a single protein. And the RTB carries it into cells and takes it to the lysosome to fix where you guys accumulate um, beta galac or GM1 ganglicide. Um, so uh, why is RTB get it good at getting into cells? There's lots of sugar on cells. So current ERTs all use something called a receptor. And a receptor is a protein that sits there. You bind to it, and that directs it in. So all of these little blobs here are proteins. Those are receptors. But what you'll notice is that there's not very many of them, and all of them are different. So if you're using a receptor, you end up limited by the number of stuff you can get in the cell. Well. RTB binds to sugars, and all of these little um, decorations of diamonds and, and triangles are all sugar. So the idea is that RTB probably, we hope, can get into more cells, and more can be taken into a cell, because it uses a completely different mechanism. So in fact, this may be a little bit hard to see, but we can measure that. So um, in this picture, this is actually a picture of a stained um, patient fibroblasts, so those are skin cells, and you can see that in a GM1 patient, there's all this white garbage. This is a wild-type fibroblast, and the little blue dots are actually nuclei telling us where the, the cells are, but you can see that you go from um, no very clean cells to all of this garbage, which is what is linked with disease, especially if that happens in um, neurons. So we have a nice way where we can see whether or not if we give RTB beta gal into these cells, can we make them look like that cell? And we've done that essentially, we, we show it in a graph form here where this is the, the wild type and here's a sick person, but all you really have to look at is these in the red, which is here is a GM1 ganglioidosis patient, here is the treated, and we've reduced the beta gal. So that looks pretty promising. Um, so how do you get things to the brain? Um, typically people give ERTs, these enzymes, through an IV. But the problem is, is there's something called the blood-brain barrier. And you probably have heard about that before in your reading, which is like, this is why you can't fix the central nervous system components. So what is the blood-brain barrier? So by the way, I'm a plant scientist by training. So I go to the anatomy books and I say, well, where is the blood-brain barrier? How come I can't see it in the little diagram? And I'm thinking it's like some membrane under there. Um, no, it turns out that the blood-brain barrier is modified blood cells. So um, normally your capillaries are leaky through your body because that's how you dump things there. But in the brain, they've, they've sealed them with cement with the idea that we want to protect the brain from viruses, from nasty stuff, and we want to limit so that all of the, the things that go into the brain are exactly what they need. And that means there's very few receptors on there and nothing leaks in. So that is a big challenge, but we're working on that actually um, in a study that's funded by the National um, Institutes of Health. So our grant was to look at a second strategy, which is could we sneak into the brain from the nose? And that idea is that if you look at this interface between the top of your nose and the brain, there's like a bone there, but there's a whole bunch of nerves that sit in there to pick up and sense 
the stuff that comes in through your nose and then tell the brain to go see things. So we um, basically asked the question in this grant whether or not RTB beta gal could go, would sneak in through the brain, um, through the nose. So our specific aims were first to produce and analyze the protein. Um, second is to do a short-term test to deliver it into the, to, to drop it in the nose of, of a GM mouse, which by the way, just imagine the size of that nostril. Um, and it's worse than you think. Um, and the last is to actually compare that route to whether we put it in by a, a traditional IV. Um, so, I don't know if you were here last year, but those of you who suffered through my talk last year will know that we have an odd system where we actually make our human proteins in plants. And so, um, very simply, what we do is we take the DNA component in a vector, we take our plant, we turn it upside down in a solution, pull a vacuum, and then throw it back in the incubator. And four days later, all of those leaf cells have been making our human protein like mad. We can then purify it, and we can use it to stick it in that humongous nose of a mouse. Um, so, and just because these are pretty small plants and you freak out, this is actually a very scalable system. And I don't know if any of you heard about the secret serum for Ebola um, that was used. It was actually made at scale in a very large facility. So there is usable facilities. Um, so that has been accomplished. We made it. Um, so then the question is, does it work? OK? So our idea is it would go into the nose, and it would mobilize. And the part of the brain that is at the end of those nerves is called the olfactory bulb. Um, olfactory, of course, being the sense of smell. So this is what that same thing looks like in a mouse, where you've got um, the nostril and the nose. and our goal is to get it across all of this garbage and get it right there to that olfactory, um, to the olfactory bulb. So we put it in the nose, and we looked to see if it went to the olfactory bulb. So by the way, bear with me, because this is science. Um, the answer is no, it didn't go. And that was our, our primary hypothesis, is that this would work. But all is not lost, because it turns out that it did, we did find it in the cerebellum, which is way back here, um, which sort of like, you know, dude, what's it doing back there? Um, so there are two ways it could get there. One is that there's something called a trigeminal nerve that sort of creeps from here and here and sort of dumps kind of back here somewhere. Um, the other thing is that it could be, we knew we had a fair amount of, OK, a mouse nose is, is small. We've already said that. So what happens is when you put that drop in, some rolls down into its lungs and into its stomach. So the other idea is that it actually went down into the rest of the body, got into the brain, and came across through the blood-brain barrier. So we have spent the last part looking at whether or not we can actually utilize this through more traditional ways of the blood-brain barrier. Um, oh, now it went. All right, sorry. There. So, um, this thing isn't very happy, this little poker. Okay, so we took beta gal, RTB, which is our compound, and we introduced it into the tail vein of a mouse. So we put it way down there, and we asked whether it got way up here. So the first thing we looked, and this is what the data actually looks like. If we, um, this is a mouse that got it um, twice a week for two weeks. So they had four injections of our protein. And we're looking here at the spleen and the liver, which don't really accumulate a lot of GM1. But we can look here and see whether the enzyme is present. And you can see, so the way this is, is this is a normal mouse. These two lanes are, are beta gal, GM1 mice that haven't been treated. And these are GM1 mice that have been treated um, four times with the enzyme. And what you can see is that something gets in there. Um, and in fact, the whole protein is at a size called 120 kilodaltons. But when it gets to the lysosome, it gets processed. And that's the most active beta-gal. 
So the good news is, is here's wild type, here's the amount of, of GM1, so that's the nasty substrate that is in the spleen, and after two, two weeks of, of production, we basically clear that. So that's very good. You're doing things in the body. Um, and you can see that the liver does the exact same thing. We're doing things in the body. So the question is, of course, do we get it in the brain? So here we're looking at the cerebellum and then the spinal cord, and it's the exact same um, uh, situation. What you'll notice is that these are all darker because it's hard to, there's not much stuff in the brain because there's so much um, uh, gray matter between the actual cell business. But what you can see is that we definitely see some there, and most significantly, if this is the amount of G1, GM1 in, this, in, in the untreated mice, we're definitely getting some significant correction. So it doesn't seem to be perfect in all of the mice, but this was only four treatments. But going from here to those two guys especially looks really good. And similarly, we see that here's the wild type level, and we're attaining some nice responses in the spinal cord. So um, this is actually terrific news for us because it suggests that the RTB can take um, take beta-gal enzyme, move it across the blood-brain barrier, get into the cells that need to be corrected, and actually treat and reduce GM1 ganglocytosis. So for us, this is a breakthrough, and we're very, very excited about this. Um, this was one study. There were, I think, four treated mice um, for two weeks and four treated mice for four weeks, so it's fairly consistent. But what we need to do now is look across the entire brain and see that it's fixing all of the cells in there, which is what we're just in the process of doing. Um, but overall, we're, we were a bit disappointed that we couldn't just shove it up a nose. Um, but we're not giving up on that. It might still be an opportunity to be a, a follow-on supplement. Um, but we're very excited to see that we have a situation where we can show that our carrier takes it across the blood-brain barrier. Um, so this is a big deal. So I just want to say many, many, many thanks to, to, to the TASACS organization. You made a difference not only in funding the research, but making it very real to us. And I would like to say that here's our little crew um, at BioStrategies, and here's Sandra Diazzo and, and uh, uh, Ida Anaziata that are the, the key people doing it, and Jorge Ayala right there is the project leader of GM1. So we have a lot of very dedicated people who put in way more than eight hours a day to try to make a difference. Thanks so much. Well, thank you very much indeed, Carol, for a very exciting talk. We're now moving on to three consecutive talks on gene therapy. And gene therapy, the approaches that are being taken are really a sort of a common approach, but we're going to hear about how they're being applied in different ways to different diseases. And we're delighted that Dominic uh, Gessler, um, who's a physician scientist working with Dr. Gao at the University of Massachusetts Medical Center, is going to give the first of these talks on gene therapy. Uh, this is to do with Canavan disease, and he was funded in 2010 by NTSAD. So again, you can see how the research funding is really sort of stimulating research activity that's going on long beyond the funding period for each of these grants. Yes. Um, we, I've also been asked if I could ask all of the speakers to stand on the left, my left, your right, um, to give their talks. Thank you. Thank you. All right. I cannot um, provide you with a British accent. You have to take my German one, so I hope you still understand me. Um, thanks for the introduction. So, okay. Can you hear me now? Even more? Okay. okay. Oh, I see. Okay. Um, yeah, so my name is Dominic. I'm at the Gene Therapy Center at Dr. Gauss Lab at UMass, and we're working on cannabis disease gene therapy. And I want to give you um, an overview over two important goals that we have achieved recently. 
um, using gene, uh, gene therapy for Kenneman's disease. So for everyone who's not familiar with this disease, it's a rare disorder that's caused by mutation in aspartoacylase, which is primarily expressed in the oligodendrocytes in the brain. And when it's mutated, what, you, what happens is you have an accumulation of N-acetyl aspartate, or NAA. And here on this picture, you see um, Rachel and, and Jessica, which you might be familiar with. Um, Jessica did an internship at Dr. Gao's lab to see what this Kahneman research is all about and how she can contribute and help to develop gene therapy for her sister, Rachel, who has Kahneman's disease. Um, people have been trying to, to, to divide Kahneman disease into severe and mild forms, which is primarily determined by the onset of disease. Um, and I just want to highlight a few symptoms that we also see in our mouse models, which are like ataxia, that means they, the coordination is kind of off, um, seizure, paralysis. Um, yeah. So the, we are using a virus that has no associated disease. It's called adeno-associated adeno virus. And we basically just put the healthy gene inside and then inject it intravenously. And we are using a dose that can efficiently target the entire brain. Um, we are using two mouse models. One to answer the question, can we treat very early Kahneman mice? So within the first four weeks of life. OK, no. OK, now we, we are back. Um, and this mouse model has a very severe phenotype, and it, the life expectancy is around four weeks. And then we have a second mouse model that survives basically like a regular mouse up to years. So the first question was, can we develop a gene therapy for Kahneman's disease that is effective and sustainable, meaning Sustainable in this sense, you inject once and it treats the mouse for a lifetime, basically. So we use this first mouse model that usually dies after four weeks. And then measured weight. And what you can see here is untreated that the mice die very early. The black curve is a wild-type mouse. And then this is our first generation gene therapy. You see a difference between wild-type and the treated mice. This is our second generation, which is improved and much stronger. And you can see it equals the wild type curve. And so, next step, we tested them on motor function. Okay, now someone is interfering. Thank you. So, the first mouse you were going to see is an untreated mouse. It's very sick, and it can barely stand on the road rod. And the speed of the road rod increases over time. And then you see here our third generation gene therapy, second generation, and a wild type mouse. And they try their best to stay on top. So the second generation mouse dropped off. Now the wild type mouse fell off. In our third generation gene therapies, which is the most potent we have so far, the mouse just keeps running. And it far, by far exceeds the performance of the wild type mouse. So this particular mouse, it took 214 seconds versus 89. And if you, oops. No, next. And then if you look at the data after one year, you see here wild-type mice. First generation, those mice cannot perform at all. Second generation and third generation. Even after one year, those mice still have a better motor function on rotor rod than wild-type mice. Because it's so much fun to watch after one year. This time we put on two wild type mice. Here's a female, here's a male, and this is the third generation treated mouse. As usual, the males give in early. 
the female wild type is also gone, and the treated wild uh, treated Canavan mouse still runs. And then, so this is just motor function. What about brain pathology? So we looked at the brain slides, uh, at the brain of those mice you see here, wild type. This is in MRI, first generation, second generation, third generation. And you can see in the first generation, after one year, you get these white signals back, which is basically the disease comes back. But in our third generation, it's completely gone. Still, the signal or the image looks like a wild type mouse. And then at one point, of course, we had to sacrifice the mice, and you look at the brain on the, under the microscope, and you can see here different brain regions. I hope it's probably hard to see from the back. But what you're looking for in Canavan is you see a lot of holes in the brain. So this is a wild-type mouse. You don't see any um, holes that are unexpected. This is our first generation. You can see here large parts of the brain are completely gone. Our second generation. You still have a few holes. I'm sorry. Oh, too fast. And this is our third generation. After one year, it looks completely normal, like wild type. OK, so that kind of suggests we can design a, a gene therapy that is efficient and long lasting. The second question was, how late can we treat? because not, not always patients are diagnosed very early on in the disease process. So we used this second mouse model. Yeah. OK. So we used the second mouse model and started treating those mice at juvenile age. And you see, back please. And you see wild type mice here in black. The red curve is untreated. And then we, st we are starting here. You see the untreated mice still uh, have a lower weight, and after treatment, they slowly catch up and equal wild type mice. So even at a juvenile age, at least in the mouse model, they still recovered. OK, next. And then we also tested them on Rotorat, of course. So here you have a wild type mouse, and these are three different mice. All the seven mice all treated, so all kind of mice all treated at juveniles, juvenile age. This one drops early. So you can see they they are pretty close together in comparison to the wild type mouse. Next one, please. And then if you do this with a lot of mice and you look at the data, at the statistics, so here is wild type mouse. This is untreated at one year. Those ones were treated right after birth, and those were treated at juvenile age. So they can completely catch up and basically do as well as um, uh, wild type mice. Next one, please. And then again, we are looking at MRI to see how the brain in the living animals looks like. Here you see wild type untreated CD mouse, you see these, those white signals, treated at P1, meaning right after birth, treated at six, uh, juvenile age, and you see it's completely normalized, like in wild type. And so I mentioned early NAA accumulates in the brain of Canavan mice, or Canavan patient actually, so we wanted to see can we reduce NAA actually. And so at one year, we had different groups. One is here wild type. This is untreated. You see very high levels of NAA. Treated right after birth, treated as juvenile age. And you see it's completely normalized. And the same is true for urine, where NAA classically also accumulates. Next. And then we moved even further. Now we trust, started treating mice at adult age. You see here, here on the left a wild type mouse. In the middle, an untreated mouse, you can see very severe uh, movement disorder. It looks very uh, skinny, a little hunched. 
And on the right, you see a mouse that was treated at, at adult age. Five minutes? Okay, thanks. And they're, they're basically moving as wild type. Can you go one, one more? So I showed you a lot of motor function, but what about cognitive function, meaning memory function, for example? So we wanted to know, can we, can we restore memory function in those mice? And one way to, of testing it, this is you can use, it's called T-Maze. You put the mouse he down here, there's a little door. Then you open the door, the mouse runs left or right. And you repeat this over and over again. And mice usually start alternating if they have normal memory function because they remember, remember, oh, I've been in the left side, now I want to see what's on the right side. And so when you, when you test mice at seven months, here those mice were treated at adults, at adult age. Those are wild type mice and those are untreated. You see that even if you treat them very late, they end up performing as well as wild type mice. Next. And finally, we wanted to know, so Canavan disease is a leukodystrophy. You have a lot of brain damage in the white, white part of the brain. So we looked at, uh, under electron microscopy, at the myelin. This is an untreated mouse. It's si seven weeks. You see only a few of these dark rings. Those are axons, and myelin is wrapped around it. And it looks very unorganized. And on the top, you see a wild-type mouse. You see many of those dark rings, which means those are all healthy axons with myelin around. Next. And this is one week after treatment. It still looks pretty messy. But so we waited basically four weeks total. Next one. And you see the untreated mouse, it gets actually worse. You see only a very few of these dark rings, and you see, st start seeing holes in the brain. Here you have a wild type mouse, a lot of those dark rings as expected. Next. And then within four weeks after treatment, the myelin in the treated mouse completely came back, which suggests there's actually a great efficacy. <coughs> okay, I tried to basically give an update what we have done, what is one part of our gene therapy approach. One is, can we tr design an effective and sustainable, uh, sustained treatment, uh, treatment? Can we treat late um, canavan mice and still rescue them? And I hope I can con could convince you that, at least in the mouse model, I think we did a pretty good job. Next one. And this, of course, needs a lot of people, very dedicated people that work on this project. Several people are more or less involved. And of course, Dr. Gao is the PI, who is the main driving force in this approach. And of course, we had a lot of funding, including NTSAD. And I'm happy to answer any questions later. Thanks. Well, thank you very much for that really uh, incredibly promising progress that's been made. Again, just showing how funding at the right time can really drive progress in research. So thank you very much. That's looking. Um, really remarkable. So we've seen a super mouse uh, on the uh, rotor rod. <laughs> so keeping the gene therapy um, approach going, we're going to now move to uh, Miguel Estevez, who I'm sure many of you are, are familiar with, from the University of Massachusetts Medical Center. And he had um, NTSAD funding in 2015. Um, and this is really to enable translational studies moving from the lab into the clinic. And he's going to be telling us about progress uh, uh, recently um, on that front. Miguel. Thank you. Um, so I'm actually going to go over the 15 minutes so that you guys have the pleasure of seeing Stacy tackle me. Uh, I think it will be an interesting experience, at least for me. Um, so um, the, the TASACS Gene Therapy Consortium, I think I've been here, well, to this meeting almost for a decade now, actually. Um, and so today I'm going to give you a little bit of an update of where we are with the clinical translation program. Well, thank you very much indeed. You can see that the research path is uh, never straightforward. 
And the fantastic thing is that you're staying with it through all these ups and downs, and hopefully we'll come out of this with a, a very robust clinical trial at the end of it. So thank you very much indeed for that. Um, the other thing that you will have realized in that talk is how important large animal models are. And we talk about the sheep and the cats and things, but if you have to maintain these colonies and provide them as a research tool and do research on them yourselves, it's a huge, huge undertaking. And, but it's a real advantage for our field because it means we've got good animal models of these human diseases, which is something that, for instance, the Alzheimer field doesn't have. And so it means that we can make much more rapid progress. So just while they're getting set up, um, think up all of the questions that you'd like to ask all of our scientific experts, clinical experts today, because in the round table discussions, um, you'll be able to ask detailed questions, get clarification on any of the points. And also, um, the final speaker of the session will be Jerry Cox uh, from Genzyme Sanofi, who will be talking about the clinical research that was conducted here at last year's meeting, and we'll be having an update on what that led to. And, and that's all to do with trial readiness in the field. So how can we be prepared for clinical trials when we get to that point? What's going to be measured? What are robust things to measure in the community? And several of you are taking part in those research activities this year. Um, there's active sessions of uh, late onset Tay-Sachs patients this morning, and that will be continuing tomorrow. And so, again, it's just illustrating the fact that we need the medical experts, the research experts, the veterinary experts, and also the companies to work in partnership with the NTSAD to really get all of these things moving from uh, the coalface to the, to the clinic. And so it's with great pleasure to introduce our next speaker, uh, Doug Martin, um, from Auburn University School of Veterinary Medicine. And our veterinary colleagues have been absolutely critical in this journey that we're all on to try and treat these diseases. And he's going to be talking about um, using intravenous approaches to gene therapy, um, again in GM2. So Doug, thank you very much for joining us. So what I'm going to talk about today is intravascular or IV gene therapy for cats with GM2 gangliosidosis. And this is actually a model of Sandhoff disease. A lot of you have seen in some previous meetings, actually I'll just let you go ahead and advance that, a lot of you have seen in some previous meetings the results that we've uh, talked about from direct intracranial injection of cats with gene therapy. So directly injecting the brain with a gene therapy vector and, and what kind of results we were able to achieve with that approach. This is a lot, these are a lot of lines and we don't want to get bogged down in that, but basically this is a survival curve and every time the line drops, that's the death of an animal. You can see that the untreated cats are represented by this black line and they die very quickly by an average of about four and a half months. With our best treatment, the longest lived cats were able to survive an average of about 20 months. So our best, our best uh, surviving cats were about 20 months of age. And we even had a couple that lived out to 30 and 36 months of age. Not only did they survive longer, but their quality of life was a lot better. And that's represented by this clinical rating scale on the right. What, we, what you're looking at here is a clinical rating score that we give to each cat where 10 is normal and 3 is the point where they can no longer stand and we euthanize them. The untreated animals represented by these black diamonds don't do very well at all. Their disease progresses very rapidly. The treated animals treated by direct brain injection of gene therapy do much better and you can see that their uh, disease progression is much more level and much better. One thing that this chart doesn't show is that the worst symptom for the cats is a pronounced whole body tremor where they're doing like this and they can't eat and they can't use the litter box normally like a cat would. All of these treated cats, regardless of their survival, had no whole, whole body tremors. So that was a major advance for at least the quality of life of the cats. Uh, next panel, please. Yeah. This little lady is named Montreal. She lived for almost three years of age, to almost three years of age, the longest living GM2 cat ever. She was directly injected in the brain with gene therapy. So that's our gold standard. That's what we're headed for. Uh, and we want to try that and see if we can achieve similar results with 
a simple IV injection. Next slide, please. All right, one of the problems with the intracranial approach is that it's complex, and I'm not going to go through all the methodology here, but I put these up, all these details up, to show you that it's a complex procedure. It's not something that's really easy. We have to use what's called a stereotaxic apparatus to make sure that the injection needle is held in a precise position in space that, so that we're injecting exactly where we want to inject in the brain. It's not something where you can just hold it in space with your hand and inject. This, the injection procedure happens over a period of about 90 minutes. So it has to be held right where we want it to be held for a prolonged period of time. Lots of times we also have to use ultrasound to guide the needle exactly where we want it to go. So we would like to be able to do something that makes the injection procedure itself a little bit easier. Next slide, please. Another image, if you can just click on uh, right here on the little arrow that should come up. Yeah, this shows the vasculature of the cat brain. That big orange pulsing thing is a vessel that we are absolutely terrified that we're going to hit during injection of the thalamus. This is the thalamus of the cat brain right here. So we have to come in through that vessel and avoid it. That's another thing that you really don't want to have to deal with in kids if you can, if you can avoid it. You may not be able to avoid it, but if you can, it would be great. Um, next panel, please. This is what happens when you nick one of those vessels going in to inject the cat brain. You end up with a bleed in the thalamus. This particular animal circled around to the right over and over and over again. It couldn't see for a period of time, and it was basically obtunded. It just didn't know where it was. We treated it with supportive therapy, and it recovered uh, within a week's time, and it has lived for a long, long time and actually produced many litters in our colony. So he did really well, but it's still something that you would like to avoid if you can. Next slide, please. The other thing that we found out is that if we could delay disease or treat the disease in the brain and spinal cord really well, we ended up having disease in the peripheral organs. In these cats that have been, that are untreated, they never live long enough to develop peripheral organ disease. But in the animals where the central nervous system is corrected well enough, they start to have problems in the peripheral organs like they have grossly distended bladders, uh, urine volume is about five times normal in the bladder compared to, an untreat or compared to a normal cat, they have a spinal cord compression that causes problems, they have enlarged hearts, liver pathology that we can't take care of. All of this develops because the animals have been able to survive long enough to get to the point where it actually shows up clinically. Another thing that they have is this really dramatic distension of the stomach. And all of us know from having eaten Easter dinner recently that that's very uncomfortable. It's not something you want to deal with on a daily basis. It's another thing we'd like to be able to treat by perhaps an IV injection that will treat the periphery. Next slide, please. All right, so this is an image of the blood-brain barrier, which we already talked about. Carol already talked about the blood-brain barrier to us. Uh, we thought about using an IV injection of gene therapy to treat the peripheral organs, but we wondered about the blood-brain barrier. Would it exclude gene therapy the way it excludes purified enzyme? Uh, next panel, please. Several papers have been reported recently or pretty recently that show that gene therapy vectors, if they're the right type of gene therapy vector, they can get across the blood-brain barrier and perhaps treat the brain as well. So we were really excited about that. We wanted to take a two-pronged approach to try to treat the peripheral organ disease and perhaps treat the central nervous system by an IV injection. Okay, next panel. And as far as the methodology goes, it's much simpler to do an IV injection than it is an intracranial injection. Now, most of you will realize that this is a little bit of a staged photograph, okay? If this cat were actually being injected in the cephalic vein, it would not be sitting there looking so sweet. Uh, we would have to sedate the cat, and we often do for the IV injections. Still, it's a much easier procedure. Uh, next slide. So what are the results? Again, this is our clinical rating scale where 10 is normal, 3 is the score that at which we have to put the animals down because they can't stand any longer. This is, uh, these are normal cats along the top line, so they're normal throughout the, the period of the experiment. The gray diamonds represent untreated Sandhoff cats, and you can see that their disease progression is fairly rapid. We think that we've pushed out 
the uh, onset of disease and the progression of disease by about six weeks with the IV treatment. And that's represented by these red and blue lines here. Not, certainly not as good as the direct intracranial approach, but um, not a complete failure either. And we'll talk about some more positive results in the next few slides. Okay, next slide, please. This is an MRI done by Dr. Edwards, who's in the audience. Um, she does all the MRI work for us on cats and sheep and anything else that she can get her hands on, including pigs. Uh, but anyway, we'll talk about that later. <coughs> uh, <laughs> what we're actually looking at here is the white matter of the brain. And it shows up as these dark projections into the cerebral cortex. In a normal cat, that white matter is really pronounced and dark. In an untreated Sandhoff cat, the dark areas actually change intensity and become light colored. And that's indicative of myelin loss in the brain. It happens in cats, it happens in people. It's very indicative of the disease process. In the IV treated Sandhoff cats, there is some preservation of the white matter uh, in the brain. It's certainly not what we would hope for. It's not as good as the direct intracranial approach, but we've made some progress towards uh, correcting that myelin loss after IV injection. Next slide. This is MR spectroscopy, which Heather spent a lot of time and effort working out. Five minutes, thank you. Did you say 25 or five? Okay. <laughs> uh, this is MR spectroscopy. So you use an MRI machine to look at different molecules in the brain and the levels that are there in the brain. Are they normal? Are they abnormal? We won't go through each one of these, but let's just look at N-acetylhexosamine. Normal levels of N-acetylhexosamine are like this. Untreated Sandhoff cats have about five times the levels of N-acetylhexosamine. The IV-treated Sandhoff cats have intermediate levels of N-acetylhexosamine. So it's all the same picture. Everything, all of our pieces of data are sort of coming together to give us the same idea. Um, next slide. We looked at biomarkers in the cerebrospinal fluid of these IV treated cats, AST and LDH are enzymes that we have previously shown to be elevated in untreated Sandhoff cats. Um, with time, the levels of AST go up in untreated cats. These are normal levels, normal levels. We really haven't done much to correct the levels of AST and LDH in these IV treated cats. Again, same kind of thing. We may be making some progress, but we haven't corrected these biomarkers to a level that we would like. Next slide. One thing that was surprised us was we found quite a bit of enzymatic activity in the spinal cord after treating these cats by IV injection. What you're looking at here is a normal spinal cord stained with a particular substrate that turns red in the presence of hexosaminidase activity. So this is a normal level of hexosaminidase activity in a cat spinal cord. This is an untreated cat with GM2 gangliosidosis and then these are seven different slices of the spinal cord, ranging from the cervical region through the thoracic region, through the lumbar region, stained for enzymatic activity. And, and as you can see, there's quite a bit of enzymatic activity in the spinal cord. So that's something that we can really focus on and exploit in our future studies, really much more positive result than we expected from the clinical progression of the cats. Um, next slide. So one of, the, one of the things we were trying to do was test the ability of IV gene therapy to treat the central nervous system. The other thing we wanted to look at was the ability of IV gene therapy to treat the peripheral organs. And so we looked at hexosaminidase activity in the livers of these IV treated cats, and we're seeing about 40% normal activity, which is really great. If we can treat, if we can get that hexosaminidase activity back up to 40% of normal in the liver, we'll be really happy. Uh, compared to the untreated Sandhoff cats, which have almost no activity. One last thing that was positive in terms of a peripheral perspective is, next slide, the level of storage in the urine. Untreated cats have molecules called glycosaminoglycans in the urine. It's a type of storage material, but it's at very low levels. The, treated, the untreated Sandhoff cats have about five times that much um, gag material or storage material. And then the treated, IV treated cats have an intermediate level somewhere between normal and untreated. Again, all, the entire picture is sort of giving us the same answer, which is we're making some effect, but not um, as great an effect as we would like to have. 
I think this is very worth pursuing long term. And so maybe the best news that I have to give you this afternoon is, please, next slide, that the NIH agrees with us. We just learned a couple of weeks ago that NIH is going to fund a five-year project at about $3 million to study intravenous and CSF-mediated injection. Thank you. We'll be looking at both IV and CSF-mediated injection of uh, gene therapy to treat the disease. We, we have a lot of high hopes for this. This is uh, between my lab, my group at Auburn, Miguel's lab at UMass, and Tom Seyfried's lab at Boston College. So we are really, really excited about that. I think we'll have an idea within a couple of years whether this is going to be a clinically viable approach or not. So I don't really think it's going to take five years to get there, but um, that's where we are right now. So be happy to answer any questions at the round table, and thanks for your attention. Thank you very much, and congratulations on that grant. Again, it shows how seed money from NTSAD can lead to this much, much greater funding, um, and we very much look forward to seeing how that project progresses. Um, so our final speaker of the session before moving to the round tables is Jerry Cox from Sanofi Genzyme. He's a MD, PhD, and many of you will have met Jerry before, and he was conducting some very interesting clinical analyses at last year's meeting, and many of you will have participated, and he's now going to update you with the sort of outcomes from, from those studies. The idea being how can we decide on what should be measured clinically in a clinical trial, what will be useful things to measure in the patient population, so that we can try and maximize the chances of success for clinical trials in the future. Um, so I'm going to hand over now to um, Jerry, who can update us. Thanks, Fran. It's a pleasure to be here to speak to you. I've been waiting all year. We uh, had uh, quite a, a good session last year uh, evaluating patients uh, for the term we're using is clinical trial readiness. Um, a lot of people think that when a drug becomes uh, ready for use to be studied in patients that you just go ahead and give it to the patients, but you actually have to know what are we going to be looking at to know whether the drug is actually working. And so uh, last year we carried out a, a series of assessments over, uh, I think it was a, a two-hour time period, try to get a sense of whether there were some uh, types of assessments that would be of the type that would be done in a clinical trial that could show whether or not a drug worked or not. Are you advancing slides or? Okay. So uh, last year we brought together a group of uh, 12 patients, uh, 10 with late onset Tay-Sachs and two at Sandhoff. And the purpose of this slide is just to highlight that both of those conditions are caused by the same enzyme deficiency, just different subunits uh, of hexosaminidase. And in each case, there is a particular lipid called GM2 that accumulates in, in uh, Sandhoff and Tay-Sachs. It's primarily in the brain, um, and that accumulation uh, causes the uh, nerve cells in the brain to, to not function properly and, and lead to clinical symptoms. So oftentimes we do consider them uh, related uh, conditions and they have a lot of overlap. So that's why we, uh, we're looking at both. And you know, before you actually start to, to do trials for patients, you want to do a little background uh, about the disease. So what do we know about what causes uh, Tay-Sachs and Sandhoff, uh, what's responsible for early onset or late onset? And a lot of the early studies pointed towards the amount of uh, hexosaminidase activity as being really critical in determining the severity of the disease. So in uh, infants who have very little or no activity, the disease presents uh, at a very young age, and the amount of uh, GM2 accumulates very quickly. Uh, in other individuals that have a little bit more enzyme activity, the GM2 accumulates more slowly, and that's why those symptoms don't occur until childhood. And then there are even other patients who have more residual enzyme activity where symptoms don't begin until adolescence or sometimes in adulthood. And so we believe a lot of the underlying disease is related to the amount of substrate and the speed that it builds up. Now, about 10 years ago, uh, Ed Clodney and, and some neurologists uh, got together 
and they studied a group of uh, late onset Tay-Sachs patients, and they were characterizing what we call the natural history of the condition. So in the average patient, uh, when do different symptoms occur? And what they found was that in adolescence is when a lot of the patients began to complain of issues with balance, um, <clears throat> uh, some uh, muscle weakness, uh, difficulty climbing stairs, uh, even in some cases psychosis or mood disorders. Uh, and then over the next uh, decade or two decades, uh, this would progress uh, to the point where uh, now other organ systems became affected, so eye movements, uh, uh, speech uh, being more difficult to understand, what we call dysarthria, and continued uh, progression of the really lack of coordination of, of motor control, what we call ataxia. Uh, and that includes uh, unsteady gait, uh, poor balance, uh, difficulty uh, with precise movements uh, using your hands. And then over time, it, it progresses uh, more and more until late adulthood. So we look at this and we say, okay, there's a lot of medical issues here, but if you were to have a new drug, what would you actually look at? How would you quantitate this? And is this uh, really reality? Is this what other patients are are complaining of at those ages as well, because this was a small sample size. And so we thought last year it would be really good to almost start with a blank uh, sheet of paper and conduct some focus groups with patients and caregivers and just ask open-ended questions about their condition and what their complaints were, what mattered most to them. And uh, with those uh, discussion groups and reviewing the literature, we also picked some assessments. We made educated guesses what based on these types of symptoms, what types of assessments might uh, be sensitive uh, to show uh, degree of severity and, and how frequent uh, the changes are. So last year we did what's called a cross-sectional study, meaning we have a group of patients that we look at at one point in time, and we're gonna look across that whole group and try to uh, reach some conclusions about the uh, disease state. And what we were specifically doing is wondering were there measures that we could look at that could actually uh, grade the patients from mild to severe? Were there other uh, functional assessments that uh, would give us an indication if some patients were having more difficulty doing a particular task versus another? Uh, and the reason I mention that is uh, to get a drug approved by the FDA, uh, there's a very simple criteria. Uh, you have to show that there's an improvement in the way a patient feels, functions, or survives. So survival usually is not an option for a lot of clinical trials unless you're dealing with a rapidly progressive disease like cancer. Uh, symptoms, uh, you know, people can vary in their symptoms over the course of a day from one day to the next. You really need a large number of patients in order to uh, show an effect on symptoms. And then there's function. And so there's a lot of tests that I think we can exploit uh, that look at different aspects of functioning, you know, walking ability, speaking ability, uh, using your hands, thinking. And that's what we focused on last year. Um, during the roundtable discussions, I think uh, Allah Hamed is here who conducted some of these patient interviews and uh, will give some feedback on on what we learned there, but the issues that the patients really seem to highlight uh, were uh, difficulty walking with an awkward gait, uh, fear of falling, uh, because very difficult to catch themselves uh, with a the poor balance, and uh, difficulties with speech and communication. Uh, next slide. So uh, we did this uh, study. Uh, we put together a protocol where we specify what we're gonna do. Uh, we send it to an independent group that reviews it to make sure it's ethical, that's called an IRB. We have an informed consent that patients read, and then if they agree to all the uh, conditions and terms, they sign it, and then we go ahead and we do the study. And I've just listed here uh, several of the items that we looked at. We evaluated some severity scales, either just simple scales or scales more related to ataxia. We had an assessment of mobility, and I use that as a general term. It's not just walking, but actually getting up out of a chair, transferring, that's also a form of mobility. Uh, hand dexterity, how well can someone use their uh, hands to do a, a fine motor task. We looked at tremor, 
uh, speech clarity uh, by reading a uh, standardized uh, passage called the Rainbow Passage. Executive function, a type of uh, thinking. Uh, this test uh, is called the trail making test. I call it connect the dots, and you'll see why in a minute. But it involves some thinking. Uh, they're not just any dots. You have to connect them in a certain order that requires some thinking. And then we looked at some quality of life measures as well. So the first thing we do when we do a study is we ask, who are we dealing with? What does the patient population look like? And you could see that uh, the average age was mid-adulthood, 47. Uh, just over half the patients were males, all were Caucasian, 40% uh, were Ashkenazi Jewish. Of the 12 patients, uh, 10 had late onset Tay-Sachs, two had late onset Sandhoff. A highly educated group compared to a lot of other studies with college education. You can see majority of patients had been married, either currently or past, had children, and just over half the patients uh, were not able to work. And then we look at the disease, and what I find really striking here is that from the time that uh, patients told us they had their first symptom to the time they got diagnosed, on average it was about 18 years. And that's just unacceptable. I mean, the disease is progressing during that time period. So we see that with a lot of other lysosomal storage disorders that we treat as well. And then from the time of diagnosis to the time we saw them last year, it was another 12 years. So we're dealing with a population that's had symptoms for 30 years on average. And so that's a, if you will, a skewed group because that group is going to look quite different than perhaps newly diagnosed patients or, or patients that come to medical attention because of an affected sibling. Uh, previous slide. Uh, we also found that uh, just under half the patients required caregivers. Uh, nearly all the patients used some kind of uh, assisted device for ambulation, either a wheelchair, a walker, or a knee brace for stabilization. And about half the patients had dysarthria, or difficult to understand speech. So the first thing we did was we wanted to look at the uh, disease severity. And there's a very simple scale that we use that just goes from completely normal to as severe as you can imagine on the left with just some intermediate steps going from mild to moderate to severe. That's a pretty crude scale, but I think there is an element of validity to it. Um, on the right is a, a more uh, specific scale uh, related to ataxia. Um, and this looks at different areas that uh, ataxia can manifest. So gait is the uh, walking uh, quality, quality of walk. Uh, the knee tibia test is the lower motor uh, uh, coordination. Finger to nose is upper motor coordination. Dysarthria is the speech. And oculomotor is the eye changes. Next slide. Uh, one of the first things we want to know is whether older patients had more disease severity than younger patients, and we found that that wasn't the case. We had some older patients that were mild, some that were more severe, and the same with the younger patients. So neither of those scales seemed to correlate with age. Next slide. But uh, reassuringly, the physician global impression correlated very well with the ataxia. So what that says is that what the physician is actually seeing uh, is the ataxia, which we're measuring specifically, and the two of them are kind of linking up. So what we think is the disease severity is showing up as the ataxia. Next slide. Um, and then we wanted to know, well, this ataxia scale, does it correlate with any of the functional measures that we did? So this get up and go test, uh, patients uh, rise out of a chair, they walk 10 feet, they come back and they sit down. And normally you should be able to do that in about 12 seconds or less. But we found that on average, patients took about 20 seconds. Many of them were using walkers. And we also found that five patients couldn't do the test because they were either in wheelchairs or they couldn't get up. So that was important to know, because when you have a, an assessment for a clinical trial, you'd like to have all the patients be able to do the assessment. And here, about almost half of them couldn't do it. Next slide. We also looked at the fine motor coordination, putting pegs into a, a peg board and taking them out. Uh, we found that that was also, uh, on average, at the lower end of the, the normal range, and it also correlated uh, nicely with the bar score. Uh, about 40% of the patients uh, registered uh, as below the normal range for doing that task. That's a time task. 
We also had patients uh, trace spirals, which looks at tremor, and uh, that also correlated with the uh, ataxia score. Uh, next slide. And we looked at speech, uh, just in the interest of time, that also correlated with that uh, simple bar score we looked at. And then the trail making test, we have people uh, trace, uh, connecting the dots, either sequential numbers or alternating numbers and letters. And that's also a time test that involves uh, thinking. Uh, next slide, oh, back one. And uh, those tests also uh, correlate with a bar score. So a lot of the functional tests were correlating with the disease severity score uh, that we used. And I think what I would just say, what we learned last year is I think there are gonna be functional tests that will be very informative for clinical trials. Some of them, I think, now knowing the patient population better, uh, we may need to think of doing some different tests, like getting up out of a chair is very difficult. So this year we did a simple walk test, we added that. Uh, last year, we just had a very simple scale for looking at speech. It was like a five-point scale. Uh, this year, we actually uh, had patients recite single words as well as sentences as part of a more standardized uh, speech assessment. And I just want to thank everyone that participated in the assessments uh, last year and this year in particular to uh, NTSAD, uh, Sue, for helping to corral everyone together uh, for these sessions and, and putting together the logistics, and also the uh, patients who participated. We had very good turnout uh, this year again. Uh, you heard that we were doing the sessions this morning. We'll be doing more tomorrow. Uh, we have even new patients uh, coming in this year. So one of the uh, things we'll be looking at this year is whether any of the scores that we measured last year are now different this year and if they track with any kind of change in disease status. So thank you very much. Okay, well, thank you very much indeed. Um, again, I think we've gone from everything from very basic science of how to put things into the mouse nostril through to clinical assessment. And it's now time for, first of all, to thank all of the speakers for some outstanding talks. So And we've also got a very exciting additional table, table six, um, which uh, we're delighted that uh, Jeannie Utz and Chet Whitley are going to be talking about the Synergy study for infantile and juvenile GM2. And I think that the way that this is going to work, and Sue can correct me if I'm wrong, is that the speakers um, will each be on one of the tables. And you should feel free to rotate around those tables, ask questions, listen to the discussion, participate in any way that you would like, and just feel free to move and rotate as our spaces become available. Uh, it's very informal, uh, anything you want to ask, there's no such thing as a stupid question, so feel, feel free to really um, ask the experts anything that you would like. So thanks again for your participation, and enjoy the rest of the session.